I knew somebody that was like, oh, what if we did that? They're like, well, I don't really like that flavor, but if that's what sells, I was like, no. I literally wake up every morning and I'm excited to try one of my flavors. My name's Adam Von Rothfelder and I'm the founder and CEO of Strong Coffee. If you don't like the flavor of lemon, we should probably come up with a different flavor so that every time you drink it, you're like, man, I love this shit. Yeah. That's like what you have to say every time. Back for round two. Round two, thank you guys. If you had to guess when you came on the show the first time, when do you think it was? Because I have it, I pulled it up on my phone before. January. It was released January 31st, episode 142. Wow. I, yeah. I, uh, I could look back at like my tickets because I did get a boot put on my car that day. Oh, I came out, I came out did get the boot, dude. And there was a boot on my car. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> That's why you don't go downtown anymore. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. They go, um, there's like a number. Mm. Call this number. And they take your money right there, and then they remove the boot off your car. Yeah. I was like, wow. What a It's happened to me once. It's brutal. I, I want to own a parking out, lot. I was just like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. I want to own a parking lot. They oh. must make a killing in downtown Austin. Printing. Yeah, printing yeah. cash with those boots. We should collab on that. <laughs> <laughs> just go around and put boots on cars. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Call us. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. want your Give shit unlocked? <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good rip, too. And we had... With, we were talking about this on the phone the other day. It's like you have certain directions you want to take the conversation, and then sometimes it's just so natural that you let it flow. And we talked about everything that day. And I remember the first time I came across Strong was, I think it was Knees Over Toes guy, advertise, just talking about you guys on Rogan's podcast. And I looked at the branding, and I was like, this stuff looks incredible, like protein, adaptogens, instant coffee. And I remember ordering some. And then Caleb hooked us up with that care package and you put the gummies in the care package and I didn't realize they were caffeinated. I thought they were caffeinated flavor. <laughs> yeah. So I had four at like eight o'clock at night and I was absolutely I zipping. remember getting that text. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm not going to sleep anytime soon, am I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, you are not. They were incredible. Is there something about the gummy? Is the gummy like a faster delivery mechanism for caffeine versus like drinking the coffee? Yeah, I mean, not in the sense that it takes us less time to ingest it. Mm. right because you can't just like slam a cup of coffee yeah. right even if it's ice cold that's not really something that you're gonna do uh especially if you're paying like six seven bucks a cup for you know something somewhere else like a, yeah. a coffee shop so you're not that mindset mm -hmm. it's gonna take you 20 30 minutes to ingest you know all that caffeine mm -hmm. well with like the caffeine half-life and everything it's like you're already you know, some time into it already kind of working, but it's not having enough in your system to trigger certain things until a certain amount is in your body. Yeah. Uh, Cause you need a certain amount of caffeine to shut down the adenosine receptors mm. from acknowledging that it's tired, right? right. From acknowledging that you're tired. Yeah. So it's not that coffee necessarily steps on the gas, but it keeps you from putting your foot on the brake, but you have to have like enough milligrams or a long enough leg of sorts mm -hmm. to, 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 you know, do that. Like, I do not have the willpower to only have two of any sort of gummies. Like, these create gummies that we have, we have these creatine gummies at our, our yes. place. There's, like, a little bit of sugar in them. I, I probably average, like, 15 of them per day for the past, like, five Dude, just days. ingesting, so like, I'm, 15 I'm, like, grams so of creatine now. <laughs> yeah. you look jacked. <laughs> <laughs> Are they at least five trends? to ten gummies? <laughs> <laughs> Trend gummies? That yeah. Would, well, not animal How do you like the way, does the allulose bother your stomach at all that's in those create gummies? Um, it hasn't um, because I've had food in my stomach, but this morning I took it on an empty stomach, and I was like, Oh, gets you a little doesn't gassy. Feel great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's 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 a there's like a certain type of fiber, you know, sugar reaction that happens because it's like a it's actually a fiber that it works as a sugar in the sweetness sense, but it doesn't act as sugar on your blood glucose. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting sugar, but I've read that it can you know fuck your stomach up pretty good in the sense of uh, just bloat gas kind of feeling for certain people obviously everybody has food sensitivities yeah it's yeah. got a good taste to it but it's like there's seven grams of sugar per every three gummies which are tiny too yeah that's a hard trade-off you know i mean i think mm -hmm. everybody is just looking for a way to reinvent something but they don't always look at the science you know uh i think like a great company out there that has done a great job of like redelivering products is somebody like symbiotica mm -hmm. right oh, yeah. but then you look at when you're combining creatine and water like that to make that liposomal creatine that they're making, there are actually like science would indicate that that creatine actually turns into creatinine, mm. which is not good. Right. So what does that do? 
that could be like super bad for your kidney. Shit. Oh yeah, like it can hospitalize you. So okay. it's interesting that some people are like, oh, let's put this creatine into water and it takes a while for the for that formation to happen, but say something sitting in, you know, creatine sitting in for in water for a while, like that liposomal type uh, setup that they have, it could very possibly be, you know, changing into another chemical structure. Mm. Mm. So it's it's interesting as we seek to make things unique, yeah. sometimes we could create a whole new bag of fucking problems where just plain old creatine powder is, I mean, what's wrong with that? Mm. Like it's, yeah. it's, you know, I'm always Simple. about, I'm always about like simplifying something and making it better. But, you know, I mean, how easy is it just to put five gram scoop of creatine in your mouth and take a swig of water? I mean, it's, it's water soluble and it, you know, rinses out super fast. It's not like putting a scoop of pow- protein powder in your mouth. Right. Yeah. Right. One of the things I've grown to really appreciate about you is just like the details that you get into on the formulation side and just like how your brain works when it comes to just tinkering with the formulation for strong and and other brands that you work with. And it's so cool just seeing how you think through like all the different things, even with like a random product like create, you just like have things to pull on. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a, like, I'm a fan I'm a fan of the game. Like I, I've, I've talked about it before, but it's like the first time I got a credit card, I went and maxed it out at GNC at 18 years old. Yep. I spent like $2,000 on stuff. And, you know, I, I always wanted to be in this space and I took the roundabout way by, you know, being a trainer and all these other things previously, but I never, you know, stopped being a fan of it and, and loving the supplement industry. And the more you know, the more you learn you know, the negatives of the supplement industry or like marketing Mm. and how things could be so easily sold to us as a benefit when in reality, we don't know the science, you know, to back it up. So we just take what this influencer is saying, or we just take what this marketing is saying. And we aren't actually educating ourselves. We're marketing (laughs) ourself (laughs) into something, you know, I mean, it started a while ago where ads in men's health, they would, it would look like an article. You'd be Mm. like reading this incredible article on how to get like a six pack. And it would talk about metabolic, you know, this and that, it would be like, and take this and that. And then all of a sudden you would like get through the article and you found out that it's been an ad the whole time. Mm. You know, they're called additorials, right? Where it's like, wow, I was being sold here as information, but this is actually just marketing. Right. Um, that's crap, yeah. you know, and there's been a lot of things that have come our way with, with that in the industry. And I think it's, as it's getting more towards functionality and like mm. anti and longevity and things like that, I think we're getting a little further away from, you know, the, the smoke and mirrors, but we still have to be careful with snake, the snake oil. And there is a lot of snake oil too, especially you become really attuned to it once you actually create a product too. That's something yeah, that you, you guys said to know us all early about that. <laughs> so we know all about that, especially when you understand like the margins of what these companies are making on it. And then you actually look at the label and you, you see these things that pop and you're like, this actually means nothing. Like the word natural means nothing or whatever other greenwashing they put on the product to make it seem like it's healthy. Greenwashing. That's nice. I like that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of greenwashing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, uh, because people are able to educate themselves. What I meant by like no more smoke and mirrors is like you used to be sold like a health product on how to get healthy by some like really jack dude. That's like on steroids, right? Whatever it is, you know, <laughs> liver King. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, anyways, the, now it's like we are taking health advice from a dude that you would never really have taken health advice from, but he just sounds super smart. And that's mm-hmm. like the snake oil he used to be smoke and mirrors. You know, the dumb, yeah. the big Jack guy had nothing smart to say. It was just like, I want to fucking look like him. And this yeah. is what he's taking right. versus the person that, you know, doesn't even look honestly that healthy, but has a biomedical engineering degree or something like that, that attributes some level of intelligence that they've yeah. like hacked the code of health. Mm. And that's like the snake oil, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So and then you, you have people, have. then you have people like us who are just naturally trying to solve a problem. Yeah. Right. And you know, where it's far more innocent and obvious, you know, when we look at it, like, I'm just trying to solve this problem where this other person's like, this market space is bare and I can take this over with a product that has a X percent gross profit margin and make it for way less. Right. Uh, actually I saw this, I'm not, not, not to like pick on anybody, but 
there's this guy, Gary Brecka out there where, you know, he's mm. gaining a lot of popularity and I like what he has to say. So I hopped on his website to check out the supplement line. Shame on you, right? Like there's three grams of melatonin in their sleep product. Like anybody that's read anything about sleep products in the last two years is that melatonin is not good for you. And mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, if you take too much, you can literally fuck up your sleep schedule to a point where you may not be able to actually sleep properly. Yeah. Like I know people, there's, there have been people that I've heard that have to do cold plunges before they get to bed, put a blanket on themselves with a fan underneath just to try to get their thermal temperatures the right way so they can trigger things in their brain to actually make them sleep. So they're literally struggling with sleep deprivation from taking too much melatonin. Mm. So it's like, how much melatonin do you really need? 500 micrograms. Dang. Right? Not three grams. Wow, 500 micrograms is right. all you need. To actually make it, you know, you place it around some other things that assist yeah. with relaxation, like valerian root and, you know, something that can ground you like GABA and... You know, you don't need all that melatonin. Right. That's just like a cheap fix yeah. hmm. to try to get somebody to fucking pass out. Yeah. Oh, I fell asleep fine, but I woke <laughs> up. It's like nobody blames the sleep medicine on waking back up. Right. So Breck is the guy that's helped Dana White lose all that weight, I think, right? Or he's like part of the Grant Cardone health program yeah, or yeah, something totally. like right? Yep. His stuff started going crazy viral. Lane Norton rips him apart all the time. Yeah, as yeah. As, as he likes to do. Right. Well, there was, a, there was a snippet where he was talking about cold water exposure, and he was saying, like, it's by far the best thing you can ever do for fat loss. The best thing and you can Lane's ever like, do have you ever heard of exercise before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that was, you know, one of my major points of when I started Strong Coffee, it was kind of like, look at the CEOs of the other coffee mm. companies and which one do you want to look like or perform like totally right because you know we're all at the time when i launched strong coffee it was all about biohacking and what was going on with you know these, these biohacker coffee brands and i'm like yeah man like do you want to really calculate how little time you have to work out to do something to yield a result mm -hmm. or do you want to train for a result right like your result should be strong, yeah. endure, right? Power, you know, health, like cardiac health. How do you get cardiac health if you're only exercising for five minutes a day? Yeah. You know, using a vibration plate. Or, <laughs> you know, all these, all these bullshit things that I've seen where it's like, no, hard fucking work. Yeah. You know, you don't have to train your fucking dick off because like that's going to go in the other direction. But you also can't just stand on a vibration plate and jump in a cold bath and ride a bicycle for five minutes with an oxygen mask on and assume that you're going to, you know, one, out, you know, outlive the other person. I mean, like, you might be so weak that when you fall over, your hip cracks. Yeah. yeah. Because you haven't been loading your body with resistance. Right. So there's all these things that we just kind of get lost in. Yeah. You know? The, the biohacking space is bizarre to me. Yeah, it just like it's like over over indexing to these weird things that I feel like health in general should you shouldn't be all that stressed out at the end of it. Like you should have just like a, a very nice sequence and flow to like how you support your long term health, and like over indexing to all these little things like all the wearables and all that. Like I'm cool if that's like a season of your life, but if you're doing that for years, I, dude, I don't know. Well, effectively, why do we need? to measure something much longer than gaining a base for our understanding of what does what for us, exactly. right? Because if you go further than that point, you're really just getting caught up in the data and not even living anymore, right? Right. And I think that you look at a lot of people and you can measure what you're doing every single day, but then you wake up and you're like, I got a bad sleep score. And it's like, well, what did you do last night? Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you know that that's not good for you. Yeah. yeah. Right? And you've learned that for the last two years while you're wearing your wearable technology, but you haven't adjusted your behavior. You just are excited for the outcome in the morning mm -hmm. and then getting the good or the bad triggers you to then do something else. You're right. being externally motivated. Right. Yeah. Right? You're not being internally motivated. And I think that that's a, a big piece of it where... I, there's a great book that Brian McKenzie and Andy Galpin wrote a couple years ago called Unplug, mm. which was kind of, yes, these measurables are great, but you also have to just get out there and fucking do it. Yeah. Right? You can't just keep measuring everything and bubble wrapping yourself from these things because 
running at first, you may not recover from, but if you keep running, your level of recovery within a certain period of time will improve. Yeah. But if you just keep on seeing bad numbers every time you go for a run, you're going to stop running. Yeah. You know, and that's that's a problem within itself. Yeah, on Saturday at that HPLT event, we had a really interesting conversation with this guy, Dr. Lat Mont- Montsor. He's the research lead at HVMN, the ketone IQ shots. Oh, okay. Yep. And he's got like three PhDs. The guy's absolutely brilliant. And we asked him a question on, hey, whether it's like exogenous ketones, cold plunging, do you think that data, additional data and studies are going to be necessary for it to be more mainstream? And one of the things he said is, I think like things like wearables or data, et cetera, they're really valuable when you have like metabolic dysfunction and you don't really know where to start. But eventually when you start to get your health under control, like you should have a good like intrinsic barometer for like, hey, I feel good after I slept or hey, these foods make me feel really good. Like eventually you should be able to develop that intuition on your own. Yeah. I mean, does, do you guys work with HVMN? Is that like a brand that you're, spo- okay, so, okay, cool. So head nod to maybe being questioning mm-hmm. what they're doing too. So what's interesting is that they're not the first person to talk about ketones. No. Exogenous right. ketones have been readily available, BHB, you know, butyric acid, mm-hmm. right, for 10 plus years. So almost 10 years. So yeah. prove it which is probably one of the largest ketone companies in the world. I was first introduced to exogenous ketones back in 2014. Mm. So almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the, the conversation of it, when you ingest ketones, yes, you do have ketones in your blood, but you are not in ketosis. There is a difference. Mm. And for anybody that doesn't know the difference, again, you have been marketed to, (laughs) You actually have to go out and read. So having ketones in your body and being in a state of ketosis are two totally different fucking things. Just because mm. you take exogenous ketones doesn't mean your body is going to use fat for fuel. Yeah. Damn. You are literally just putting ketones in your brain, which feels good. Mm. You are going to, if you piss on a strip, it will show ketones in your blood, right? In your urine. But you are not in ketosis. What does exogenous ketones in your brain do for you? It does help you with appetite suppression. It does help you with focus. It does help you with some endurance factors, which is great. But where they're studying and where they're proving these things, you know, where it's so readily like, oh, this makes a lot of sense, is the military. Mm. These people are running on very little, right? right? So they possibly do reach a state of ketosis after being in the field, having very limited meals, for a period of time and excessive exercise is burning through their blood, burning through all that glucose in their body. But you are not in ketosis. Mm. Just like it is, (laughs) they imply that you are because being keto would be an attractive thing because then you would be reducing inflammation, biomarkers, like all these other things. You'd be burning fat if you have excess fat. But again, (laughs) it's like, that's not actually what's happening. Yet, they're selling these bottles for ridiculous amounts of money because BHB is expensive as shit. Mm. And it tastes awful, right? It's like super hard to flavor. It's hard to work with. And they just didn't even try to flavor it and work with it. They're just like, fuck it, put it in some water and yeah. tell it to say it's a shot. Where like Prove It is putting it in like delicious drinks that you powderize and you pour it in water. Again, expensive, you know, same result. But... um yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's marketing. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's a good point because I do think that they, there's like a very gray line that's being walked, but I do think that there are a lot of people that are buying these products thinking, oh, I can eat carbs, but if I drink this, I'm going to be in a state of ketosis. For sure they do. For sure. And I mean, everybody's looking for the easy button. And yeah. it's staying, saying no to sugar and saying no to carbohydrates is yeah. much more challenging than drinking a ketone drink. Right. Right? So, of course... It's kind of the same thing around the idea of skipping breakfast Mm -hmm. that one coffee company made very popular, right? And it was like, skip breakfast, you're now fasting, you just drink this coffee with this oil and like all this stuff and butter, and you're in a fasted state. Mm -hmm. That's bullshit. Yeah. You're not fucking fasted. Like the minute that your body is breaking down the caffeine and the fiber that's in coffee, your liver, like all that stuff's happening... Where it's like, you, I have people that'll be like, oh, well, I don't want to break fast. I'm like, well, how long are you fasting? And they'll tell me, 
I'm like, well, what are you seeking? And they're like, autophagy. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that's not even long enough to start with. Yeah. It's like 36 hours. Yeah. yeah. Like you need 36 hours to reach that. You're telling me that you're just not eating for 18? It's yeah. like you are literally just following a caloric deficit diet based off of time restricted eating, right? That is what it is. Yeah. Because it's hard to consume 3,000 calories clean in a day, even with an eight hour eating window. Yes. Right. right? How hard it would be to consume that amount of calories in a four to six hour window. Yeah. Way harder. Yeah. Right? So you're creating a psychological parameter of caloric restriction when in fact we should be actually based off of the science reverse intermittent fasting. Yeah. Where we're eating breakfast in the morning and getting our melatonin and our ghrelin and getting outside and getting vitamin D versus, you know, and then stop eating at like 3 p.m., right? 4 p.m., whatever it is. Yeah. And then go the rest of the time to restrict the calorie window. Yeah. That at least will aid in your sleep. Right. Yes. Right? Where it's like the reverse is not helping you sleep. And sleep is one of the biggest question marks that we all have in our health. Yeah. But yet that's like one of the most popular ways to eat. Yeah. It's like, hmm. Mm. Like, I wonder if that fit the narrative of the product. Mm. Right. So my narrative of my product is breakfast is badass. Yeah. yeah. We are the champions of breakfast. Yeah. Right. Like break your fast, <laughs> have your coffee, have your proteins, have your fats. First thing, have some water, then drink that, then go eat a regular meal, then go keep eating and then stop eating around three or four. If that's what you so choose to do, if you want to restrict your window like you currently are right. in the reverse fashion. Yeah. I've been trying to master that recently. Just like not eating close to bedtime. Yeah. And, I mean, it's tough. Like trying it to is. rework that habit. But I've noticed that my sleep is so much better when I stop eating at like three or four o'clock. So much better. Just make your three, four o'clock meal kind of heavier on the carb region if that's like where you're gonna, you know, and you'll sleep even better. Cause you're you'll you'll have a nice little blood sugar elevation and then a dip. Mm. And then that dip will just naturally line up with your sleep. So it's it's to stay away from like heavy fats for your last meal. Mm. Kind of front load your fats and then back load your carbs. Uh, for better sleep. Gotcha. Are you are you into fasting for longer periods of time at all? Like, would you do like 24, 48 hours? I used to be. I used to be. I haven't done it a lot. I, I should. It's been more challenging. Um, I, I, I used to do it because I would have a photo shoot coming up. Right. And I would just like not eat for three days, two days. You know, and I'm like, oh, well, I'm fucking fasting. Yes. Yeah. Science. And, <laughs> and I'm thin enough to wear this 42 when I'm really a 46, right. you know, suit. Um, and I just have to like pull my shoulders together a little bit and yeah. like be small. I couldn't be big, you know? Um, and for, you know, based on that, I think ultimately that it's not something that I do often now, but it is something that I think about where I'm like, I should start fasting once a month where I just, you know, take off food on a, a given, you know, couple of days in a row. When you have children, it's a little more challenging because uh, it's so easy to fuck up. Yes. Like I'm like making breakfast for them and I steal a bite of their food. I'm like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so, I mean, it's, uh, Caleb and I, whenever we travel, I'm like, maybe we should fast the next two days, you know? And then... <laughs> I'm like, wait, there's this bomb ass Mexican place down this road. You know, I, yeah. I enjoy living, um, you know, but I think one of the things that I do is I don't eat a lot, like a lot of the times. I once mm. read a book, you know, the, the more you eat, the sooner you're dead uh, was basically the summary of the book. So I have eaten a lot less as I've gotten a little bit older, leaning more towards protein. I've cleaned up my diet so much that I don't ever feel like I need to really detox. I mean, the junkiest thing I have in a, you know, in a day is like a carbohydrate that mm-hmm. might have, you know, some phytic enzymes in it or, you know, some, you know, slightly refined carbohydrates, you know, like found in sourdough. Right. But like, I don't eat regular bread or, mm. you know, like the crappiest thing I may have had last week is like a, some noodles with spaghetti, yeah. you know, but it's I'm like gluten-free noodles and, you know, whatever. And, but I mean, at the same time, I also do want to live a little bit. Right. You know, this life is short. I lost, I lost my dad and my brother young enough to like yeah. see how short life is that, you know, is as much as we want to imagine that if we just stopped eating certain things like 
completely, or if we fasted for 36 hours every three weeks, that that might extend our life, you know, at the same time, just imagine the moments that you're also missing, you know, in that at the same time. Yeah, I would argue that sharing like a pasta dinner with your girls is actually healthier for you than not enjoying that and being like some rigid robot that has to eat something separate. Totally, yeah, then answering the questions of like, why am I not eating? And then having to like explain it to them, possibly even developing food eating disorders with them because yeah. they don't fully understand or grasp. And it's, you know, those are things that I'm consciously aware of all the time because I do want them to understand you know, some sense of moderation, but my kids also will turn down a soda if they're offered one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause they know that that's not the moderation. Yeah. Like that's like, <laughs> that's outside of our spectrum of moderation. Mm. Well, dude, I do think a lot of the health influencers actually do have, a, what would you call it, an eating disorder or like food dysmorphia or something like that? I don't know what the, the correct terminology is, but I remember Paul Saladino saying that he's never going to eat a cookie ever again, as long as he lives. And I'm like, for me to go back to Jersey around Christmas time and not enjoy like these amazing cookies that my grandma or my mom made, it's like, that's just something I fundamentally disagree with. And that's now, where he started to lose me a little bit. Is Paul Saladino the- Heart and soil. Heart and soil, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, it's great that he is willing to experiment to find the extreme. Mm -hmm. But I also think that he also discovered that's where you make money. Yeah. yeah. Right. So by saying something so polarizing and extreme in that sense, it gives somebody hope to the idea that they could do this too. And even if they fall short, they'll, they'll be amazing, Definitely. right? And I think that the extreme always sells. That's why we went from the paleo diet being highly popular, right? Popularized to then it morphing into the keto diet. So take mm -hmm. out all the starches. And then the keto diet morphed into the carnivore diet at the same time, mm -hmm. while the popularization of keto brought up the popularization of plant because it was on the full other end of the spectrum. So it's always like the opposites that attract us. Mm -hmm. And then we hope to find balance within those opposites. Mm -hmm. But often people fall to the extreme and then they fall to the other extreme. Yeah. And they never land in the middle. And that is kind of the toxicity of the health industry, constantly, you know, shaming or discovering, you know, new things where it's like, you're so early in this discovery that you're telling me that there's no science that would say that if you ate an apple, you'd be way healthier with all that meat. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, just one fucking apple a week. Yeah. yeah. Like, have you ever actually studied that? You know, and mm -hmm. of course not, because that would open up the window to that fruit's okay. So then it's like, well, what do you actually stand for? Right. Well, yeah. you created that extreme. Now you have to live in it. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, now everybody's eating just meat. It's like, well, you got to go more extreme. Yeah. No pepper. Yeah, no pepper. Just salt. <laughs> yeah, just salt. It's like, well, pff, fuck that. Do you think they'll get more extreme than carnivore? Like, I mean, air diets. I mean, there are there are diets. <laughs> I mean, disgusting. that's a joke. That's a joke. But um, <laughs> just Google, kidding. Google it. I heard about the air diet on the podcast. I'm really interested. Selling you capsules of air. Yeah, yeah. Dude, that's the next thing. $42. It's purified air in there. Strong um, coffee's air edition. Yes. You know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, there are extremes. I mean, there are people, you know, the, the sun gazers, right? Like, not saying that that's like the next thing, but you do have people that, sun gaze and like drink nothing but buttermilk for like the first couple of weeks and then they stare Spread. at the they stare, <laughs> <laughs> and then they stare they at the sun it. you know for a certain period of time and apparently that gives them all the cellular energy they need and like these people go months without eating you yeah. know after they do this transition and it's like what have, have you heard of the jack cruz guy yeah 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 how's he so fat <laughs> great question <laughs> I, I don't get it like I, the first time i ever met him i was like this, you know, he's the hardcore keto guy, right? I think so. Yeah. But he's like an outs, he's like a Nazi about being in the sun 24 seven. Like he thinks right. all root cause of disease is from the sun. I think I've never listened but his to his original, scouts, but his original, all, all speculation on money. Yeah. Thinks. His original <laughs> approach to the health market though, was him being a car hardcore keto guy, right? Mm -hmm. It was like yeah. no carbs. And it was like the Jack Cruz, you know, like, oh, like I remember everybody just kind of talking about this guy. And I met him one time and he was, it was funny. It was actually at that butter coffee uh, oil company's convention uh, <laughs> that I was asked to speak at. Um, and I was, I was there and I'm 
walking up to this group and they're having this conversation. I'm just kind of like, oh, what's, you know, what's happening? And this one very disheveled looking guy points at me and goes, what do you do? And I started telling him what I did. And Jack Cruz felt like he was being interrupted. And I'm like, well, what does this guy do? And he's like, oh, he's a, you know, anti-carbohydrates, like all, you know, very sciencey, this and that. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. And what do you do? He's like, oh, I work at music. I'm like, what's your name? He's like, Rick Rubin. Mm. And I go, oh, cool. You know, I have no idea who the fuck he is. Yeah. You know, but I mean, he was responsible for a lot of music that I loved. Um, but the entire time after Jack Cruz, uh, you know, said what he did, I was thinking, I couldn't like stop thinking, like, why is this guy still fat? Yeah. You know, if this is like your specialty and this is what you do, like, how are you so heavy? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that to be rude to anybody who's overweight, but if you're going to practice something that you're telling everybody is going to make you thin, healthy, and this and that, it's like clearly you might be sneaking ice cream when nobody is looking or something. I don't really understand it. Yeah, the equation mm. just is not is not holding up. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't. Away. It, it, it it tends to be that for a lot of people. You know, it's. Yeah. I mean, there are people who obviously know a lot and don't always practice what they preach. Right. You know, I mean, there are strength coaches out there in the world that like know everything about building muscle and science, but You're they right. are not muscular at all. Yeah, so interesting. Which I, is hard to ingest because then it's like, well, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I got in a conversation with somebody that is, you know, that is hardcore Catholic. And I said, I have, I, I love, like, I love, you know, going to church. I, you know, I, I, you know, I have, you know, a, a prayer app. Like I look at these things, like I studied theology in college. Um, but I can't sit in a church and have a fat guy tell me no. what to do because he's sitting from a place that is hypocritical. Right. Because, I mean, that is an indication of like two sins in itself. Yeah. Greed, right? You know, like, they're like, if you're that heavy and you're telling me how to live, it's like, I know we're all supposed to, you know, have grace for people in their space of where they're at. But it's like, you've been doing this for a really long time. You've been heavy for a really long time. I'm pretty sure you've mm -hmm. had enough grace yeah. in this moment. That's why you would love our pastor Scott at our church. Thrive. Is he jacked? He's jacked. Dude, I, yeah, I mean, he does yeah, half sign iron hands. And he, one of his things is he like he says, "I think Christians should be the healthiest group of people." One hundred percent. I mean, especially when you look at uh, a friend of mine, John Durant, has been writing a book about how basically Christianity was developed for us to reduce the spread of disease. And because we're, if you look at the things that it says in the Bible, it's like, don't touch a dead body. It's like, why would you say that? Mm -hmm. In case they have the fucking plague. Yeah. In case they have something crazy disease and then you're holding this body. Yet Jesus defined the church by holding that man and then bringing mm -hmm. him back to health and life. Yeah. Because he had to define the church to show them that he was truly this person. Mm -hmm. So we had to define these things. So like uh, John, John's writing this book about how Christianity was influenced by disease control. That's and awesome. uh, you know, so we're, we should be the healthiest when yeah. like that was effectively like the roots of our spreading this word of God and you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. Yeah. Interesting. Right. We gotta get John on. I've been trying to DM him for a while, but he's been writing that book. So he has been writing that book. He yeah. seems like to be quite the ghost. I have actually yeah. sent him a couple of unanswered text messages. I'm about to send him a, "Hey, motherfucker, <laughs> <laughs> where you been, buddy? Hey, where you been, buddy?" Yeah. To, to his but, credit, when I met him, he was like, "I am the worst at responding to things." So. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. He he can be. He can be. Yeah. I trained him for a while and no became uh, pretty tight with him. And when I was living in LA, and he's he's definitely. He's a real writer. You know, he's definitely a, a cerebral person. I mean, I, you know, sat with a, you know, I, I, tra I trained and sat with many New York Times bestselling authors, but like Neil Strauss, I mean, being, you know, one of the most famous, I mean, I would show up to his house every day at 4.30 in the morning to wake him up, make coffee, take his cell phone away from him, and then drive him to his writing house. So I know how in you have to be when you are reading a book writing a book right. uh whether it's for yourself or someone else like neil was at the time uh he was ghost writing but it's it's such a process to put your mind into that you you can't walk away or you might lose everything right you know what a crazy process you thought about writing a book uh, you know i have I, i've written a book 
Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's 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 not very long. It's only like seventy pages. Right. Um, I'm actually gonna do a uh, like a, a revised edition, and I would like to actually make it full length. The book is called Breaking Fast, mm-hmm. and the whole book is about dispelling the myth of fasting as we see it today, and how and why certain nutrients in our body are essential for morning and for the way our brains and our psychology work. You know, so it's like if you're ingesting protein first in the morning. Well, protein's loaded with amino acids. Yeah. Well, L-theanine mm. and these other amino acids are in there that help with serotonin and dopamine, mm-hmm. right. right? So it's like, why would you starve yourself of these things during the time of day where you need the most amount of willpower and mm-hmm. and, and and elevation, you know, mind elevation and, and, and control of those thoughts, right? And focus versus fasting and tying into a stress hormone that makes you think that if you don't pay attention, a tiger is going to fucking kill you. Mm-hmm. Cause that's effectively what you're connecting to is like that. I haven't eaten and I might get eaten. Mm. Right. And then your boss is calling you up. Ring, 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 you motherfucker. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Your wife's calling you. You forgot to take out the garbage. You know, it's like school's calling you. Your kid's sick at home. What do you want us to do? You yeah. know, all these things. And you're trying to somehow suppress these hormones, you know, and, and everything that's going on in your body when you have, you know, all the, what you take in, you are what you eat, right? Like, how are you controlling uh, all that goodness inside your body? Those chemical experiments of sorts. So that book will come in the future. It will come in the future. Yeah. I mean, it already exists. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, and it's just, you know, it's it's not my, it's not what I wanted to do. It's mm-hmm. not like my finished project. People that read it, it was the first person that ever wrote it was actually Bill Block, the person that bought Miramax out of the whole like Harvey Weinstein thing. And I was Bill Block's trainer. And he uh I handed him two things to read. I, I wrote a movie script and I wrote a book. Mm. And the movie script actually got a B plus from their grading house. Really? Got a C the first time, and then I sent it back and it got a B plus. Dang. But the movie, I mean the 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 yeah, it was funny, dude. We like me and Bill actually reached out to Zach, Zach Efron together. And he was like, if Zach would have been on that film, Bill would have made that movie. Wow. And Zach uh, didn't want to do any comedies. So it, it ended up not working. But he, wrote the, he read the book then. And he's like, the book is great. He's like, I just want to know what the fuck to do. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I read all this information, but I don't know what, how to apply it all and what mm. to do now. And I'm like, uh... Good, good point. So we'll add that in. <laughs> so we'll add that go. in with an entire how I recommend to eat, you know, throughout the day with like an actual like nutritional plan. Um, and then even a workout program that, you know, you can basically do without overstressing your body and still focusing on developing, you know, the strength that you need for the force and the, the force that needs to be applied for bone density and muscle without an excessive amount of time, mm. right? I don't have two hours to train a day. I train an hour a day. Right. So it's, it's really about, I'm going to steal a word from functional patterns. It's really about being, you know, as parabolic as possible, mm. right? The idea of as much energy output in the shortest period of time with the most efficient movements. So yeah. utilizing your entire body for a movement instead of just isolating yourself in this exercise. Mm. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's not shocking to me that you've also, you've already written a book and a screenplay because you, the listener has to go back to episode 142. You got to go back to 142. Because you've lived back. 15 lives in one. <laughs> so as we said, CPG founder of Strong Coffee, owned Drench right in Milwaukee, which was your gym. Yep. You were a trainer. I was. You were an MMA fighter. I was. You were a Versace model. I was. And you had what, 37 jobs out total? 32 jobs. 32 jobs. Yep. I was a union electrician. That was my last yep. real job. Um, and I've been self-employed, you know, since 2008 and, you know, almost, I mean, almost 15 years. Yeah. Um, and it's been an incredible journey, Mm -hmm. uh, because all those things have taught me something, Yeah. you know, and I've applied them to everything. And I mean, even more recently we've launched 60th and Upham, uh, which is our creative house. So helping people with product and brand development, which, you know, I only started out of what I felt like was my necessity to give back Yes. after receiving all these lessons, good and bad, so that other people could 
learn from my mistakes, not just my yeah. successes, right? And because you can learn so much more from your losses. I don't want other people to go through those losses. So for, you know, a small fee, I can help you navigate, you know, these, these things. And uh, it's been really cool. I mean, we've launched successfully three other brands and products in the last six months. And we've helped three other, pro three other companies with formulation and manufacturing changes, you know, and now, now we're working with, you know, another, like an Austin, uh, you know, guy that's pretty famous for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to help him, you know, redo his brand in a process that we call recombobulation at uh, 60th and Upham. So 60th and Upham, um, the slogan of the creative house is where creativity and logic intersect. Mm -hmm. And 60th and Upham was the street that I grew up on. Got it. So that's the connection. I like that. Yeah, and, and recombobulation is a term that I stole from the Milwaukee airport where they have this section that's called the recombobulation zone that when you get off the air, air, airplane, you check to see if you have all your shit. Mm. I've, I've heard of discombobulating, but recombobulating is, yes. uh, is different. Yeah, yeah. So discombobulation is the idea of like your thoughts are everywhere, yeah. right? Recombobulating is pulling all your thoughts back together in a new form, mm. like right? So, you know, it's, it's kind of like the bag, you know, the, 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 the progress of the bag and how the bag yeah. design changed over five years of strong coffee where it's like the first bag had a certain look, the next bag had a certain other look. And then the third bag was an evolution of those for communication. And it's like, how do I know that we need to communicate better? Because I know that people, when they're in our old bags, if I would be at an event, people would be reading the bag and looking at it and yet still not know actually what it is they'd be mm -hmm. like is there coffee in here right so i knew that i had to express what the product is that much faster and communicate so the bag had to evolve and that's a, something that like i love like i can't not help but to see yes. how i could make something it's not better because it's my idea it's better because it makes more fucking sense when you look at something logically and you understand how a brain works it's like it reads left to right you know our, our our time that we have is seconds so three to five words you know it's like it, mm. in that time if you are not captured within those first three to five words reading left to right if you don't know what it is you're just moving on yes and there are so many people that have great designs of their bags and all this shit but i don't know what the fuck it is right. and i'm looking at a thumbnail this big on on a screen yeah right. you know and i wanted to call out so it's, it's, it's been a really cool, uh, you know, evolution of where I am because my goal was to, I, I always wanted to own a supplement company was like a thought I was something I said, but my goal was to always be the world's best trainer. Yeah. Like I want to be, I wanted to be the best. I want people to be like, that guy is the best. Mm. I mean, to this day, I still have people call me to ask me if I'll train them when they're coming into town really? five years, six years later. And I'm like, dude, I haven't trained people in five years. Yeah. I've gotten a PhD in five years on CPG. I'm a better CPG specialist and creative brand development specialist than I ever was a trainer. Mm. And I was on a TV show covers of magazines. You know, I was flown around the world to train people. And I mean, at one time I was making $30,000 a month as a trainer. Right. And it's like, I gave all that aside because I wanted to do something bigger, strong coffee, bigger, meaning not more money, but the idea of impact. Right. Yeah. And now I'm helping other people make a bigger impact yeah. and it's very rewarding. Yeah. 60th and Upham just makes so much sense intuitively for us being on the receiving end of how you are with your friends and brands and things like that. Like now for the listener, like we were lucky enough to get you as part of the Noble team. You're an advisor to us, a mentor to us. But even before we officially tied the knot, like you were just offering up so much free advice to the point where I was going to, I was going to share this. I was trying to figure out the right time to work it in, but I've got that Bible app. So I get sent like a, you know, a daily quote and I screenshot it and sent it to you three weeks ago. Cause it just really reminded me of you and it's Proverbs seventeen seventeen, And it says a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. And I think I just texted you and was like, you're the brother. Because that's how you are for us, and I feel like so many other people. Um, and I'm curious if that's just something that's just been innate to you, or where, where do you think that comes from? You know, I mean, 
I come from a family that gave when they had nothing to give. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Adopting a, a kid who's paraplegic when he's one years old in the hospital, you know, fostering. I, I've had five, six foster siblings, you know, in my time. I've, you know, our house was always crazy. And, you know, I am far more selfish than my parents in that manner mm. because I do believe in the sanctity of my home and my children having a home that's like feels like theirs and not somebody else's. So I can't put myself out there like that. But I can't stand by and watch somebody hurt themselves, mm -hmm. right? I can't stand by and watch somebody make a mistake. I can't stand by and watch somebody not succeed in their goals and their dreams. And even if that means I'm getting fucked over in the process, that's just this fault that I have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've helped so many people that wouldn't even admit that I fucking have helped them, right? And that is, you know, because... They have their own shit that they're trying to deal with. They're mm -hmm. wanting to validate their actions and who they are in their life. And they think that by giving me credit that it'll take away something from them. And that's mm. unfortunately, you know, the smoke and mirrors of, of uh, like, if you ever read the four agreements, you know, it's they're They're just seeing all that smoke. Yeah. You know, they're not seeing the reflection and that they're projecting their situation onto, onto me. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I needed that text that day. Mm. You know, I really did. Uh, because I, I do help so many people that a friend of mine even sent me a message like two days after you sent me that about no good deed goes unpunished. Mm. And it's like, you're fucking right, man. Yeah. Because like I've helped so many people without expecting anything return. It's not that I expect, but I also, that's like money, you know, I don't expect you to jump online and be like, thank the heavens that Adam helped me do this yeah. thing. I don't expect that. But I don't expect you to deny my effort. Totally. Right? right? You know, you can't take away what, I, what I've what i done. And that doesn't scar me, though, because I keep doing it. You know, as somebody called me the other day while Caleb and I were in California, and they chewed my brain for 40 minutes trying to get as much information out of me as I can on their brand. Yeah. When they know that this is literally what I make money doing right yeah and you you're know? in the middle of a seven figure race and i'm in and the middle still of a, taking time and i'm in the middle of a seven figure race exactly right like there is you know where caleb's literally looking at me off the phone like fucking hang up yeah <laughs> like you know and the other day somebody called us and they were like oh i just want to take as much notes and absorb as much info as possible i'm like i'm actually going to throw up a wall right here yeah. this time because this time I'm actually going to make sure that I get money from yeah. this situation or something yeah. in writing that says, if I make a claim that I helped you with this, like you are going to fucking acknowledge it. Yeah. Right. You know, cause this is how I, my goal is to build something so big that somebody like Disney will come to me and be like, we need to come up with a consumable product to mirror this launch of this thing. And we don't know what to do or how to do it. Right. And I'm going to take that thing, this new movie, and I'm going to create an entire thing around it that creates a consumable identity to this other thing, you know, and I'll be like, and, and, and that thing will have the person drink it and they'll be like, oh, thank God I had this. And, mm. and then kids will be able to buy that. Like why a toy? Right. Yeah. Toy you buy once. Mm -hmm. You could be selling this kid Buzz Lightyear super juice. Yeah. That would be actually healthy. Mm -hmm. And you can make millions and get kids to drink something. It yeah. could be impactful, but yet we're sitting here making sun kissed mm -hmm. with licensed Fortnite or some bullshit. And it's just, there's so many, it's so easy today for a brand to launch a product. If they know the problem that they're trying to solve. Yeah. With so the right help. To, to the point of, of starting uh 60th, 60th and up them, right? 60th and up them. Yeah. So, to the point of starting that, has that helped you create a little bit more of a boundary on your time just so you can start to like more openly be like, Hey, look, like I've got a business for this where if you really want like deep dive into building a brand, I can, I can consult with you. Yeah. I mean, in some way, I mean, I kind of let Caleb be the gateway to that for mm -hmm. me. I mean, he's my partner in 60th and Upham and you know, uh, ultimately I do need my time protected because I'm, I'm, 
at one time, I mean, like two months ago, I had five brains in my, I had five different brands in my head Yeah, that I was literally like formulating, creating wall also hit strong coffee's biggest month, right? Like there was a lot of things happening. 60th and up them happened so fast that it happened out of necessity. Mm. We were, I, we were, we, we've been getting so many, you know, personal messages or, you know, inquiries of, do I help other people? You know, Hey, like I get just a DMS like, Hey, I want to launch a coffee company. And I wondering if you could help me find out where you get bags and stuff from. It's like, cool. Here's my link to sign up. You can apply to yeah. be a 60th and up client because there's an application. I don't just take anybody because I want to see your idea. Mm. I want to see like how much do you actually know about this industry first before we get into this to the point where Caleb and I knew very quickly that we were going to have to create a course for people to absorb the amount of information, pre-absorb the amount of information that I'm about to give them so that they even have a fighting chance of knowing how to use the information I gave them. Mm. It's like, I can't explain brain surgery to you. That doesn't mean you're going to fucking go do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then you go through the cerebral cortex, you use a one eighth drill mm. and blah, blah. You know, you'd be like, you'd be looking at this person's head with a drill in your hand, like fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I mean, it's, it's that much, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a lot of pressure on it, especially if you're putting up your own money or say you're quitting your job to chase this dream, like whatever it is. And that you can't make mistakes. You know, the, the industry, like years ago, you could make mistakes in CPG and still, still be living, you know, it's, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's just moving so fast that if you don't do it fast as in now, somebody else is going to do it later soon. Yeah. Did you ever read the book Give and Take? No. I read it like three years ago. I think it was like Adam Grant. I'm kind of blanking on who the author is, but you know, self-explanatory title basically says there's two types of people, the giver, the taker, the giver is someone that just wants to provide as much like value and knowledge or whatever they can offer. They just want to provide that with no expectation. The problem with the giver is that you can get taken advantage of by the takers who will just, they're on the receiving end of it. So they'll just take and extract as much value from you as possible. So the whole thought process of the book is allowing you to lean into your gifts as the giver, but also having that safeguard. So you're not getting advantage, taken advantage of by the taker. And it kind of seems like through 60th and up them, it's something that's just made so much sense where you're like, look, I want to provide as much value and knowledge for people but I'm also going to like value my time the right way. And I'm going to be able to monetize this and build out a whole new source of income doing the thing that I love to do, which is help, you know, new founders and entrepreneurs and things like that. Totally. 100%. I mean, I was a coach first and I'm a coach always. Yeah. I can't help but to coach. I mean, we were, we were in California this last weekend and we stopped at, you know, uh, a, a buddy's gym, Kevin, right? Yep. Kevin over at Clava. I think it's like the Clava gym and uh, over in Lake Forest area. And we could have got like a pump session in, you know, we could have just done like what guys do when they work yeah. out. But instead I use it as an opportunity to pass along what I know because I see the way Kevin kind of walks and it's like, he has like this, like almost every other high level athlete, the way they walk uh, that uses force, they usually have their butt sticks out and their stomach dumps a little bit because mm -hmm. they're so used to, doing this, right? So linemen popping up and putting all that force in, you know, and their ass is just shooting back and all that pressure is driving into their L5, L6. And we do all this thoracic elevation and we're unplugging our ribs. So then our abs aren't connected. So then we're using our back muscles instead of our ab muscles. Well, it's like, hey, let me show you something wild. So I'm like showing them this and I, I just spent like 20. So instead of me working out at that point, I just spent the last 25 minutes coaching of my workout him. coaching them on this thing that I feel that he needs to learn and that feels good for me teaching because then I'm learning it even more, but I'm passing it along. You know, I, I, for the first time in my life, I could afford a personal trainer, right? I mean, personal trainers aren't cheap in Austin, 150 no. an hour, right? So it's like, I got a trainer, bought 30 sessions to, so I could learn this stuff over at Functional Patterns. And whenever I learn something like that, I pass it along. I learned Kali, you know, and I, by everybody, that I have ever taught Kali, I end up buying them a pair of Kali sticks, mm. you know? And it's just like, it's a $15 purchase on Amazon, you know, whatever. But those 40 minutes that we spent together of hitting sticks, you know, and learning that, 
you're going to remember this moment forever. And when you look right. at those collie sticks, you're going to remember that. And you learn something. And I taught you that. And to me, that's, that's like what I love doing. Mm. So to take something that I've done really better than anything. I mean, I've scaled strong coffee to millions of dollars in revenue where it's like not many people can ever say that they've done that. Yeah. And I've done it with so many things that have gone wrong <laughs> that it's like, if you don't have as bad a luck as I had, you're going to do great. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, just, just focus on the problem mm -hmm. and focus on your why, yeah. right? Those are the two biggest things. What problem are you solving and why are the fuck are you doing this? Mm. For anyone listening who's thinking about starting a brand, what, what do most founders or what do most brands get wrong in the beginning? Because there's so much that can go wrong in the beginning that will change the entire trajectory of the rest of you know, what, what you end up doing. They don't know what they're doing. Meaning like they don't know what problem they're solving. They, um, somebody's like, I want to make a protein product. Great. There's a lot of other protein products. Mm -hmm. So what problem are you solving? You're just creating another problem by creating another choice yeah. in the protein section. Yeah. There is a subsector of individuals that need protein that only eat meat based things. Okay. So what's the problem that we're solving? Well, sometimes mm -hmm. they can't always eat meat and they need protein and they need the organ meats. Great. Now that sounds like a problem that you're solving, right? So it's like that is the problem you're solving for that specific user. If you just created protein, it would have been fucking stupid. Yeah. Right? So it's like, I didn't just create coffee. I created coffee for somebody who was in a hurry that needs nutritional value. They don't have time to eat breakfast and they need energy and they don't have more than 40 seconds. It's like, I'm solving all these yeah. problems. Figure out the problem you're solving, right? And find it, find, see if you can do it in a unique way that somebody is not without creating another problem, yeah. right? So I think that anybody who's truly looking to start a brand is make sure that you're doing it for those reasons and not because you don't want to just work for somebody else. Because trust me, if you're doing it for those reasons, you're just going to end up working for somebody else soon, Yeah. right? With so, less money than you had before. <laughs> with less money than you had before. Or maybe even less confidence. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, there could be a lot of things that get attacked in your entrepreneurial, you know, ness, your stages of, of uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism. And, I mean, one of them could definitely be, like, damaging confidence. You know, like, dude, I really believed in this. I believed in myself, and I'm failing. Mm. You know, it's like, well, you're not failing. I mean... You know, maybe if you're not waking up and doing the work, then you are contributing it to the failure. But like, you're not failing until you have just completely stopped and have given up. Have you given up? Right. No. You know, and it's like, okay, then. I mean, Apple was sold, right? And then rebought. Yeah. Right? So it's like, they didn't fail. They just had to take a, a moment to refigure and then come back. Recombobulate. Recombobulate and do a hmm. way fucking bigger and better. Right? So it's... I think you just have to be open to everything, right? I think that's really, somebody comes up to you and says like, I can do this, this, and this for you and I give me 20% of your company. Well, if you have a contract that says they're gonna do that, that, and for you and they do that, that, and for you, give them 20% of your company is the fucking least you could do. Yeah. Right? Because like 80% of something is better than zero of nothing, you know, zero yeah. of everything. You know, it's like, so I, I just believe that a lot of people get caught up in the, percentages of how much they own and this and that because they're you know gonna have an exit and this and that it's like you know don't think that way just yeah. think about why you do it what problem you're solving and just constantly be open to whatever comes your way if it's a pivot you know whatever it is I wanted to dig into what you were saying around mindset and confidence because you're in a unique spot where, like you said, Strong just had one of the big, the biggest month ever. You're successfully in the process of raising seven figures of capital. But I also know now that we know you as a close friend that there's been like a lot of adversity that you've overcome too. And I'm just curious how you thought about continuing to cultivate that confidence or that mindset when shit was hitting the fan, when stuff with Whole Foods went awry. Like if you'd be able to dig into that, I feel like that would be so valuable for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a couple of things that I've heard. I mean, do I've, I have personally detached myself by about 95% that I am strong coffee and not Adam Rothfelder, mm. right? That's a huge piece. Like you are not strong coffee. 
If somebody asks you how you are doing, do not answer how strong coffee is doing. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, it can become a slippery slope to think that that is you because that is not you. Yeah. That is that is a piece. I have, I have gone through worse. Right? Only you could determine that. So there's, I think it was, you know, there's a, like a Bible, you know, a Bible story about uh, Abraham and uh, who's Abraham's son. Um, I don't know. We'll check. Yeah, we'll check. Abraham's out son, we'll call it. Yeah. We'll call him Abraham's yeah. son. So they're farmers and they're in a valley and it hasn't rained in a very long time and their crops are drying up and their animals are going to die. And they're praying for water and they're praying for water and they hear and they, they get a message and it's like dig. They didn't say when the water's coming. Mm. So what do you do? Do you just blindly dig? Yeah. Or do you wait for the rain to start coming and start digging? Well, if you wait for that long, then you're not going to have anywhere for the water to go. Right? So if you dig it, God will do it mm -hmm. is like the idea because after these guys dug for endless amounts of time, it just started pouring well, they had all these holes dug to capture all this rain and were abundant in, in that thought. So I just have had my own faith knowing that I have gone through more and I have the faith of those around me, like my wife, like Caleb, the people that without a doubt believe in me mm. and tell me all the time how great of a job I'm doing so it's like there is some external motivation, but there is a lot of internal belief in myself because I have personally gone through worse. And anything put before me is something that I can tackle because, you know, I am, I am in a sense, and we all are like, you know, so much more than this physical body, mm -hmm. right? Of what we think we can overcome. Yeah. It's like we are resilient beyond so much. So, so, so much thought that somebody be like, Oh my God, how'd you survive? It's like, well, I didn't sit and cry about it. Mm. You know, I may have been upset for about one hour when I got off that phone call, but then I realized being upset is like a fucking rocking chair. It's not going to get me anywhere. So now what do I do? Well, I solved the problem, right? It's like start coming up with solutions. A hundred of them, maybe one of them will work. It's like the scene in end game where, you know, the sorcerer guy, you know, is like Dr. Strange, you know, sits down and he meditates and he still sees a million ways that this could go, but there's only one mm. that will actually win. Yeah. And it's like, and he can't tell anybody because it would ruin it all. It would just mess it up. Like, but yet the one way happened, you know, mm -hmm. right. and that's where I'm, where I'm at. It's like, there is a million ways and I know there's one way that I'm going to win and it's deep down inside of me. Yeah. So I am that way mm. <laughs> and I can never, uh, I can never believe otherwise. Cause if you don't, then you'll quit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then you did fail. It's so interesting. Entrepreneurship is this blend of like adaptability and flexibility, but you also need to be rigid at the same time. Like you need to be so strongly convicted in what you're doing, but you also need to be open-minded to the fact that you might need to change. And so like, it, it really forces you to like reconcile a lot of like inner work and, and deep uh, feelings of com confidence and faith, not necessarily even in yourself, but in the fact that you you can get through certain things that are just going to pop up over the course of just living and, and starting a business. So like, I feel like over the past 18 months, it's been such a unique learning experience of like tr coming up with an idea and trying to like, like stress test it and be rigid in the fact that you like, this is the idea that you want to run with, but also being open to the idea of how can we be flexible here and continue to iterate? Yeah. I, I yeah. I mean, you have to be willing to adapt, right? I mean, I have literally formulated strong coffee with other ingredients in case ingredients somehow became mm. passe. Right. Where it's like, oh, what would happen if that ingredient became uh, not good, like yeah. in the eye of the beholder? Right. Because the space can shift very quickly where a scientific report comes up and it goes viral. And all of a sudden your 
holding, you know, 10,000 bags of some shit that you're like, uh, a bag of poison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a bag of poison, basically, or a bag of nothing, yeah. you know, that has no actual value. So you have to be willing to adapt. You just don't throw the baby with the bathwater. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like you had a good idea, but maybe you just got to change a couple things. You know, maybe you have to alter it. And that's something I find when people reach out to me for consulting where I'm like, look, your product isn't the problem. It's your fucking website and the offer. Mm. Like this is your website has no SEO. There's no metadata. There's no this. Yeah. There's no that. I don't know what it is, mm. but I've had the product and it's great. Yeah. Let's repackage the product in something different and come up with a better call to action yeah. with a website that is actually developing SEO so Google can crawl it and actually pulls up when people search for something of this nature, mm -hmm. right? And it's so people so easily lose confidence in themselves because it's not selling that they're like, oh, it must be a bad product. It's like, or you just don't know what the fuck you're doing. And yeah. all you got to do is ask, ask somebody to help you so that they can take this great idea that you actually have and get it out in front of people. Yeah. Right. Like be confident in what you thought. If you are not 100% convicted, if you do not believe in what you are selling, they will know. Yeah. You cannot go in front of somebody with a decently tasting something that's not that great and sell it and feel confident as they sip it in front of you if you do not enjoy sipping it. Right? Right? You have to hundred percent agree with something. You know, it's like, I, I knew somebody that was like, Oh, what if we did that? They're like, well, I don't really like that flavor, but if that's what sells, I was like, no, no, no. Yes. That flavor does sell the best. But if you don't like the flavor of lemon, we should probably come up with a different flavor so that every time you drink it, you're like, man, I love this shit. Yeah. Right. That's like what you have to say every time I fucking love strong coffee. I literally wake up every morning and I'm excited to yes. try one of my flavors. I don't know. What's it going to be today? Hazelnut, vanilla, daybreaker, peppermint. Wait, when's this episode coming out? Ooh, early December. Oh, we're good. Peppermint yeah. mocha. Oh. That's right. It's on sale now, bitches, or it might be all gone. Go what it. color is that bag going to be? Tiffany blue. Ooh. So sexy. A little peppermint mocha. Yep, so sexy. I came Caleb. up with a Tiffany blue. Caleb. Caleb. Shout uh, out. <laughs> um, we had peppermint mocha. A while ago, we used a Tiffany blue package and uh, it was, we had a lot of people that wanted it back. It's funny because to me, that tasted like ass comparative to what our new peppermint mocha tastes like. So we actually use peppermint oil and uh, instead of natural like aromas and stuff like that, where it's like when you actually go after you drink it, you can feel the coolness mm. in your mouth. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's like, it's fucking bomb. And we have some other really great flavors coming too. But it's a really powerful point, especially as a founder of like not doing what makes sense from a business perspective, but acting in a way where you truly believe in the product because the audience will can tell if you're faking it or not. Yeah, 100%. I mean, obviously there does have to be a balance. There's, there's an 80, 20 rule that I was taught by a chef and he said 80 of the menu has 80% of the menu has to be for them. 20% of the menu has to be for you. So mm. say you're a chef and you're opening up this badass restaurant. You got duck foie gras and you got these steaks and you got this and you have no burger because you don't want to flip burgers because you're a fucking chef. And that is be, that is beneath you. Mm. You're going to lose a very large majority of people who, when they're like, do you want to go to that place? They're like, man, no, they don't got burgers. Yeah. And it's like, what? Why would you not do that? Right? So you have to be willing to put enough on there for them where enough of it is also for you. If you like the flavor of mango orange, I guarantee you there's a million other people that are going to like mango orange. Right. right? You know, so it's like, that's not going to be the thing. But you do have to make sure that it's solving their problems, mm. not just your problem. Right. right. Where it's like, this is a community thing. You can't become, you can't sell millions of dollars of products selling it to yourself. Right. So you do have to be solving the problems and that's where like surveys come in. So once you get out there and you start selling your product, you're sending emails and you're surveying with very specific questions that would are easy to answer, but it let you know what's going on without asking them that specific question. Cause they specifically wouldn't know how to answer that maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, why do you use strong coffee? Well, that's not a great question yeah. to ask somebody because then they're like, why do I use it? But it's like, when do you, you know, when do you find, you know, when do you like to drink strong coffee? It's like before my workout, first thing when I wake up, 
after lunch, you know, and it's like, boom, 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 okay. So all of our data says that we could probably keep strong coffee in bags because 80% of people are drinking it when they first wake up, which yeah. means they're in their house. Right. So it's like, do we really need travel packs? Probably not. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's like, okay, what could we do with all that extra money and travel packs? Yeah. Right. And that's the game you have to play, mm. even though it's really cool to have travel packs and all these SKUs. I mean, when Unilever bought on it, they had like a hundred and I'm just going to make believe it's uh, let's say 130 SKUs. They like narrowed it down to like 30. I think Alpha Brain does like 90% of the revenue. Exactly. Right. And then they did an Alpha Brain black label. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, it's like those other problem, those other products are just loss leaders. Right. Because like if they don't sell protein, somebody is not going to come to them to do that one stop shop. Mm -hmm. right. So they're willing to sell protein at a lower cost, you know, to maybe, you know, not make as big of a margin because of all the flavoring and all that stuff costs a lot more money. And then they'll sell you on these pills that they have a 90% gross profit margin on. Yeah. You know, and it's like, holy fuck. As yeah. you say, pills pay the bills, right? Pills pay the bills, baby. Yeah, totally. What, um, so from like the back end marketing standpoint, just like you mentioned like newsletter and things like things of that nature that I think like most businesses probably have, but is there like one area where you would direct a founder, a new time founder to focus their attention on just to like simplify all the different things that they can be doing? I mean, I think that if you have limited funds and your goal is to build top line revenue and to make sure that you're not losing any money, which is very easy to do with fulfillment fees, Facebook fees, meta, you know, like all this type of stuff. I think one of the, the best hacks you can honestly do is to keep your system super lean and do multi-channel fulfillment through Amazon. Mm -hmm. When you look at what Amazon has done recently to increase their revenue, they've actually teamed up with Shopify. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to go head to head, Shopify is like, yeah, we'll take your business in the sense of people now can buy something off of your website and it's getting shipped by Amazon. And if you're collecting shipping, Amazon doesn't charge you the full percentage then of what they would charge in their service fees. But then your inventory is all being centrally located and then your customer service is going through Amazon. Wow. Right, you're, you don't need to do emails because the way Amazon works, people are going on there all the time. Mm -hmm. So if they bought strong coffee before, we're gonna hit them with an ad and our return on ad spend is so much better than Facebook or Instagram mm. that we're like two times profitable over what Instagram's profitability is on their first order. I mean, we are profitable on our first order on Instagram and you know Facebook, but our profitability is way higher on Amazon. Yeah. Right? So Amazon just has people that are there shopping. Nobody is on your website to go shopping. Mm -hmm. They're not just fucking there. They went there to go buy something. There's right. a difference. Somebody's on Amazon. They're buying light bulbs. Glance over to their corner cabinet, and they're like, oh, I do need protein. Protein. Well, I've tried that one. I've tried that one. I want to try something different. Oh, what's this? That's something mm -hmm. different. Boom. All of a sudden, next time that they look for it, they directly look for it. Or the next time they type in protein, it's too higher than it was the last mm -hmm. time because the velocity and the reviews are better, right? If you want to get into retail, then at that point, you have an amazing bargaining chip. You're like, I've sold thousands of these, thousands of this product. I have 200 five-star reviews. This is literally verified. You can't cheat this like you can on a mm. Shopify site, right? Right. So these are all verified reviews. Okay, cool. It's going to be a lot easier to work your way into a grocery store when they know that you're a product that people are actually looking for. Wow. Right? So you've spent probably 20% less on your fulfillment and shipping and storage. You know, you're getting actual metrics and velocity indicators saying like, hey, this is how well your product's doing. Over the next 90 days, mm. we assume you're probably going to sell this much. You're like, fuck, we don't have that much. We better make more. 
Right. But like you need like a, a legitimate operator to tell you numbers like that. Yeah. You know, to calculate your velocity and pair that with ad spend, you know, and then churn rate that they're seeing and they're Mm -hmm. seeing all this. So they know. So it's like my Amazon, it's like, I know that I have to send 1600 bags there in the next two weeks, or we're out of bags there in three weeks. Right. Because we're going through 1500 bags in six weeks. Mm. You know, it's like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Versus a guy that's managing your email, a guy that's managing inventory, a guy that's managing your Facebook ads, Mm -hmm. you know, like all these things, you can almost cut it down to like one team. Yeah. Right. My Amazon team. Yeah. So there's, you know, that's one of the way. And I mean, that may not be a popular thing to say because like Amazon can be the devil in some people's eyes, but you're a small business. People don't understand how much shipping costs are impacting your, yeah. your, um, your profitability rate. Right. So it's like, you'd be lucky if you are, have a 40% gross profit margin mm. after everything's said and done. You know, and then it's like you look at your overhead of your payroll and you're like, we lost $10,000 this month. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, and that's, you know, that's how, uh, how does a company like, you know, some of these, you know, ready to drink companies, how are they doing 120 million in sales and they're losing $2 million a month? You know, it's just crazy. Yeah. Shipping and, and margins. So yeah. you have to create a product that, is built to be sold online with a proper margin and find ways to reduce your outgoing costs, you know, be nickel to dimed. I mean, software on Shopify is like $4,000 a month Mm. for us. 4K? Oh, yeah. Between the apps that we're running and the subscription, because like the subscription is a percentage. So with all those things, yeah, I mean, you're, Spending 4K a month just in your fucking app stack. Right? There's, there's like thousands of or hundreds of them. And I don't even have Shopify Plus. Yeah. I just have Shopify Basic. Like, not Basic, but whatever it's called. Premium or, you know. But it's like Shopify Plus is $2,000 a month plus those fees. Yeah. yeah. They're literally making too much money. Huh? They're making too much money. Well, and it's I mean, incredible. I think that's, you know, they've done an incredible job. I mean, Shopify crushed it. You know, and Amazon has done an incredible job evolving Mm. so that they can work with a small person because for a while they were just trying to fuck the small business. Yeah, Mm. They're like, hey, this product's doing really good. Let's copy it. And then let's market that product to all these people that have been buying that product for $2 less. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah, and it doesn't have 15 grams of protein. It has 10 or something like that, but it's like all the keywords match. Right. Totally. And you're like, it's got protein in it. You don't even look at how much it has in it. No idea. And nobody really even knows. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to like put it out there. What is your unique identifier? You know, that was like a big thing with you guys where yes. I was like, it's got to say this on the bottom, like, and it's got to be more, a little bit more clear about like what's yeah. actually in it and why, you know, and it's, it's like, yeah, you're right. When we look at it, you're right. It does just say that. That doesn't say enough. Right. Yeah. That it's, that's what it is. Yes. Right. Right. It's like, oh, that's what it has in it. But what is it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yes. So that was it. like a big, a big piece. Of yeah. That was just, super helpful. You know, basic things. That's the feedback. Basic that you, in my mind. Yeah. You real. know, but not basic in somebody else's mind. But five years ago, it wasn't basic in my mind either. Yeah. You know, I, I really, I had to, I mean, dude, you'll just see me wandering down food aisles and just looking at packaging. <laughs> and I'm just, you know, just doesn't matter what, pa- a, a huge, a huge, yeah. I mean, a huge motivate, a huge uh, influence on strong coffee was actually beyond meat. Mm. Funny enough, because oh, I was like, God. "Well, because I'm like, if they can sell fake meat, bullshit, disgusting fake meat, to people in the mindset that it's replacing their meat, can I sell this awesome coffee in replacing their coffee?" I'm like, it's kind of like a similar mindset of Definitely. some sort. So I really looked at them to see like what their packaging said on it and these different things where it's like their packaging had to say it had protein in it, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, cause it was right. like, well, what am I getting from it? Yeah. You know, where it's like, if it's meat, it doesn't have to say that, Yeah, you know, but like if some meat company came out and just started saying 42 grams of protein, like in this package of meat and that was 
D- tell me that wouldn't start crushing it. It would, it. It would, it would crush. It would, crush. it would crush. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, nobody's ever done that. Like I've always yeah. had this idea for a company called Power Beef. And it was just like beef with just packaging that literally just said how many grams of protein on it. You know, with like the little macros in the corner that said like 20, 10, you know, one, you know, and it was like, instead of me trying to figure out what's a 75, 15 right. or an 85, 15 math, <laughs> an 85, 15, it's like, that's fucking math. I don't want to do that. Yeah. But if I could look at this and it says 52 grams for this pack of beef, I'm like, fuck yeah. Let's roll. <laughs> that's, let's roll. That's two meals. There are definitely some smart ranchers that are going to take notes on this yes. for sure. Yeah, I mean, hit me Genius. up. I'll help you with that whole thing. <laughs> yeah, power beef. Yeah, I mean, I'm. There was a uh, this. There's this uh, uh, jujitsu guy that I'm helping with, and I like did just like a packaging mock up, and I gave him like this, you know, kind of revisioning his concept, and I came up with a slogan, and I'm like, dude. I'm like, this slogan's so good that if you don't fucking use it, I'm going to use it. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have to come up with it. Like, <laughs> you know, and it's, 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 uh, again, though, ideas are cheap. Mm-hmm. Execution is everything. Yeah. So you could come out with a beef that says that, but if you don't know how to execute that idea visually and put it in front of the right hands, it's just going to be another failed idea. For right. sure. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Yeah, man. What's, uh, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Are we done? We're going to get kicked out of here, unfortunately. Fuck. I want right. to go for another hour. I know. All right. I get it. We, it's all good. We got we to gotta put another one on the books. Yeah, we well, do. Well, well this you is know, why we need our own studio, make it too. Consistent. Yeah. Because we, we've always just been under time crunches, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 It'd be great to, um, we'll, we'll get you guys so that, that, that course that I've been building, we've actually completed the first part of the course, and I'd love to show you guys. Oh, that would uh, be amazing. After Sweet. the episode here, we'll, we'll have uh, Caleb open up the phone and uh to show you where the course is but you know that course is gonna be coming in a couple of months um which i'm really excited about because it's just going to really lift the veil on product development and branding development and i'm i'm really proud as it's you know kind of created a uh, like a, a small step in this you know creative mankind thought uh where i you know have been recognized by you know some of the world's leading marketers like Ezra Firestone and Molly Pittman to build this course Mm. because they've never met somebody that logically understood marketing and product development at the same time. So being able to put those things together. um, So they asked me to develop this course for them and we're releasing this course from smart marketer, which is going to be amazing. It's like the Netflix of marketing, but it's the first time they've ever done a product and brand development course. So if you want to know more, and you want to follow along, check us out at 60th and Upham. Uh, it's 60th and, uh, they don't let you do the ampersand, so we actually had to spell out and, A and D, Upham. Stupid. Um, check me out at Von Rothfelder. Uh, it's more and more becoming just kind of my personal page and one for me to share more of my personal life and, you know, fucking around and hanging out with my kids and uh, focusing on more of the creative brand building aspects on 60th and Upham. And of course, you got to check out Strong Coffee Company. If you haven't yet, you've obviously been under a rock or your computer uh, is fucked up something, but you got to get online and uh, check us out, strongcoffeecompany.com or at Sun Life if you're in Texas and uh, or Amazon. You know, I'd rather you bought it from our website, but it's whatever. Well, the hazelnut mocha is definitely my favorite flavor, and I can't wait to try the peppermint too. Oh, dude, it's, yeah, I mean, I've had, no no joke, at least a combination of 200 text messages and DMs saying hazelnuts, okay. by far their favorite. Let's go. It's got and the perfect balance of sweetness in there. It does, it does. And the peppermint mocha is, is, is sweeter, but it also is also candy canes and chocolate. Yeah. You know, hazelnut, it's, you know that it's going to be a little bit more roasty, you know, like not a dry taste, but that roasted yeah. kind of nuttiness that you get from hazelnut. It's not, it's not on the level of sweetness of Nutella, mm. um, but uh, it's, it's definitely in that perfect in-between stage. I saw a nice ad by you guys with the Nutella call out. I thought it was, it was awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We, uh, was it the one with like the nuts coming out and like the splash and it yeah. says hazelnut? Yeah. That yeah. was Canva, man. Really? I'm a fucking Canva G. You're a Canva wizard. Yeah, man. You've I got mean, some great ads too. And they're great all made ad. on Canva. 
I mean, but, but also the ones of you guys in your backyard and you're like, oh drop what bro. And then it's just you twerking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, luckily, uh, being 41 and having kids and just going through the stuff I've gone through and, you know, whether it's fighting for a living or people around you dying, you can kind of lose sight of, you know, your humor. Mm. But I mean, I was the class clown in, in school, you know, and, uh, Caleb reminds me of uh, how funny we are when nobody is looking. So yes. now we're just trying to capture it when people are looking. We're actually looking for a content creator in the Austin area. Um, so if anybody's listening to this and is looking for, uh, you know, maybe their first job in uh, creating content fresh out of school or career change, we're looking for a full-time guy to trail along with us and, and capture all the madness so we can truly uh, bring ourselves to the internet mm. in the way that you will feel that you are there, you know, feeling our pain and feeling our, feeling our victories, wins, you yeah. know, all at the same time. Yeah. What a heck of a job that would be. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> doubt. I mean, I mean, just in the last two weeks, we, we've been to California hanging out with Justin Bieber, you know, and fucking playing basketball at the shoe surgeon last weekend. We were, you know, and then we went to the USC game, which we basically had fucking, you know, sideline seats and, you know, then we're, you know, a couple of weeks before that we're serving coffee and hanging out with Colorado state university and their football team and hanging out with their coaches. And yeah, I mean, then smoking weed and jumping in rivers and hiking mountains. I mean, like what the fuck, you know, where, where else are you going to, where else are you going to do that kind of stuff and call it, call it a job? Yeah, well, it's like you guys do as good as you possibly can at showing that you're building in public, but you also reach that point where you're like, damn, if we just had that videographer, we could take to the next level. It's why Midday Squares hired a videographer. That was their first hire they ever made. Totally. Yeah, right? exactly. And Midday Squares is a brand that I've watched for a long time. And I mean, if anything, I mean, like, we literally are the same company in the in, the, yeah. in a way of like, you know, the the struggles, the efforts, you know, the the type of problem that they were solving where it's like we are both functional new aged foods that are going against large corporate America companies, mm -hmm. right? Like I get it. You love your Starbucks, but I guarantee you, you love your neighbor more. Definitely. Right. And it's buying into small companies truly makes a difference. Mm. I do not make 50 million a year as a CEO. Right. I do not make 30 million a year yet. CEOs out there are making that amount of money in corporate situations. Mm -hmm. And it's like that employee is making $15 an hour at Starbucks. You are not supporting them. Yeah. They yeah. can go anywhere else and make 15 fucking dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like support a company that is actually building and trying to do something good for people. Yeah. You know, solving health problems. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, might be a tall ask, but. You know, the sling is still swinging. You know, I will take down <laughs> Goliath. We're going to take down big coffee. Yeah. Just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. Just yep. keep digging, right? Just keep digging, baby. The water's coming. Love you, brother. Thanks for doing this. Man, love you too, guys. Appreciate you. See you, Adam. See you.